Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, it's really nice to be back at, at, at Stanford. Um, some of you will know I, I, I spent a very happy year here on sabbatical, um, um, I guess about seven years ago, because I think I'm due for another sabbatical. Uh, um, this, is, I think, is my, my, my third uh, opportunity to talk in the, in the HCI seminar. I think there was 11 years between my first two and then seven between these, so I'm, 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 like, I'm speeding up. Um, so yeah, so this, this talk that I want to, um, the material I want to present today is based on a, a long-term study that we've been, that I've been doing along with some colleagues uh, of, of, it started off as a study of collaborative practice in deep space science and has evolved in a variety of, a variety of ways. When I first put a talk together around this work, I wasn't writing it as an HCI talk. Um, I'm going to try and present it a little more as an HCI talk today, or maybe perhaps an HRI talk. Right? I think what we are going to be talking about in here in a strange kind of way is, um, is human-robot interaction, um, where the robot happens to be a spacecraft around about a billion kilometers away. So I want to start off, I should start off by, by acknowledging um, some of my collaborators who've been part of this project. Um, so Janet Vertezzi, who's a sociologist and uh, in the, on the faculty at Princeton, um, and an STS scholar who also spent some time with us at Irvine, um, has been uh, one of the, sort of, has been working on aspects of this project with us uh, from, for, for many years now. Uh, Marissa Cohen, who was until recently my PhD student, is now my postdoc and will soon be um, an assistant professor at the IT University in Copenhagen. And Melissa Mismanian, who is um, one of my faculty colleagues at UC Irvine in the informatics department and is an organizational scholar. Um, uh, so so the, although I'm the only person here to present the talk, this is very much um, uh, collaborative, collaborative work. Okay, I better explain some of the stranger words in the title of my talk, and perhaps first and most importantly, try and think about what it is we mean by socio, by socio material. Um, there has been in the organizational science literature over the last five, maybe 10 years, an increasing interest in questions of socio materiality. And if you like, we could see this as the latest in a sort of historical progression of ways of thinking about the relationship between technology and social practice, technology and social stuff, organizational life, and so forth. Um, if you look back at early work in understanding what happens around technology and what people do with it, that work is often characterized by a fairly sort of naive technological determinism, the idea that, you know, technology just happens and then we all adapt, right? You know, that, that, that bang, technology falls on us like a, like a meteor um, and, uh, and somehow, you know, there, there are ripple effects that, that, that change society. Um, the next sort of historical period of studies, particularly sort of organizational studies about technology and organizational life, focused on sort of what were there broadly what we might call social constructionists. So they say, actually, you know, technology doesn't just happen to society, we make technology, and it's society and social structures that provide us with an interpretive framework for understanding what a technology might be for us. Uh, it's not purely about its intrinsic properties, it's about how it gets used. And as we all go about organizational life, social life, cultural life, we are creating meaning for the, for, for the artifacts, the technologies, for the things that we do, the things that, things that are around us. So that seems like a, um, a slightly more satisfying position than the technological determinism. It, it gives us as human beings a little bit more of a role. Um, but in some ways, it's sort of a swing of the pendulum a little too far in the other direction, which somehow, or at least in its more, um, in, in some forms, seems to uh, evacuate the technology of any kind of intrinsic properties. We stop thinking about the constraints of the technology because it's somehow all socially constructed. So when people have, over the last couple of years, been arguing for a position on technological, uh, on social and cultural analysis of technology that takes, that, that's broadly called socio-material or socio-materiality, what they want to point to is the idea that, um, that 
as things are social, they are also material. That as, um, uh, as social factors shape our experience, so too do the material, physical characteristics of technologies, spaces, places, um, um, the, things, the things that we use. And so we need, perhaps, a new kind of theoretical frame, a socio-material frame, that avoids the excesses of either technological determinism or pure social constructionism and steers a sort of middle path, right? So there's been a bunch of work of that sort emerging over the last, over the last several years. And that's sort of broadly where I'm going to be positioning, positioning this talk. However, as that sort of socio-material agenda has been has developed, it ha it, it, it's often been formulated in terms of a problem of identifying the locus of agency. That is, where things happen and who does stuff. Right? How that's like agency here for social analysis is like you know where is the where is the sort of social motive force? Right? Who is an agent? Who gets to act? Where does acting happen? Right, and so, so you know, the, even the, the accounts of socio-materiality, which lie somehow halfway between a world in which technology is the thing that does things and the social world is the thing that does things, um, even within this middle ground of socio-materiality, there's still this question of like, well, where you know the problem becomes, where do you locate the agency? Is it like how do we find the balance point, an account that incorporates the social, incorporates the material, and somehow puts them puts them together. And so lots of people, um, and I'll get more to this at the end, later in the talk where we sort of lift back up to the theory, um, lots of people have tried to sort of account for sociomateriality in terms of this thing about, well, we know that they're both important, but we need to find the balance point. We need to find where the problem is of agency. Is it more on the material side and is it more, is it more on the social side? That's an approach to sociomateriality that somehow curiously at the same time as it tries to put to the social and material together, also, I've got to argue, like holds them apart. It makes them parallel. It says they're both important, but somehow we've got to find the place where they touch, but they're somehow independent domains. And what we're going to try and argue for in this talk is an approach that tries to say, well, you know, we don't want to think about them as, as parallel domains. We want to think about them as somehow always deeply entangled, that what we call the social or what we call the material are like selective projections out of this complicated tangled ball of stuff, social material stuff. And I want to think about um, how it is that they, they come together and that actually create the context for each other. That is, it's the social that creates the context for understanding what material materiality might even be, and vice, ver and vice versa. This all sounds horribly abstract. It's going to get a little more ethnographic in a minute. Um, I'm trying to decide if I'm uh, out. The, 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 I was trying to decide if I was still going to use this slide. I'm just, like making things up on the fly. Um, uh, I'm going to come, yeah, so I'm going to say almost nothing about this, but the kind of lens we're trying to use and the, sp the, the launching off point for this is what we've been thinking about as, uh, as um, the word, around the word reconfiguring. So we talk very easily, perhaps even too easily, especially in technical circles, about reconfiguring things, about reconfiguring our technologies, about reconfiguring ourselves, about reconfiguring our organizations. Um, and certainly the people that we've been working with and if ethnographically, who I'll tell you about in a second, um, use the word reconfiguring a great deal. But we're going to stop and think about what might be implied by that word reconfiguring and start actually with the notion of figuring. So figuring is a notion that actually gets used a lot in feminist science studies and other kinds of and, and, and similar sort of critical perspectives on, on science and technology to refer to the process of producing represent or representing the world, figuring it and putting it in a figure, putting it in numbers, putting it in some kind of representational form, um, creating a representation that somehow abstracts from the world but, but, and, and in abstracting from the world makes sense of the world. 
but also produces the world that we experience because as we craft that figure, we also create a sort of le a perceptual lens for ourselves that begins to tell us about the world. So when I build a mathematical model of the world, that also then shapes how it is I'm going to encounter that world, look at that world, think about that world, and so forth. So this notion of figuring has a bi-directionality to it, that I produce a figure, a graph, a graphic, a representation, an inscription, a, no a numerical model, or whatever it is. Um, and in doing it, I also kind of like begin to like line the world up in a particular kind of way. So I've got to be conscious of the bi-directional power of that figuring. By when we turn figuring into configuring, this is con in the sense of sort of with, right? Figuring with. I never actually get to just figure things. I don't get to produce figures all on my own. The world has to cooperate. The world has to fit in with my figure. So this process of figuring that I do is actually one of engagement with the world. You've got to recognize the connection to the world that's implied by the production of the figure. And then by reconfiguring, we mean that you never get to do that just once, but it's an ongoing thing. I build a model of the world, and then I continually look at the world through that model, and I have to adjust the model, and I tweak it, and the world changes because of the model, and I have to do these things again. So it's never finished. Because a model is all, and a representation is always incomplete, there's always more work to be doing. So when, so, so we found that we sort of, um, you'll see when I get to the end, when I like to come back to this, but we actually, you know, when people would start to talk about reconfiguration, what we found really interesting sort of analytically in that are all three of these notions. That is, bringing the world into alignment with some kind of depiction of it that we can have technological access to, doing that in a way that understands a connection between representational practice and the world, and doing it over and over and over and over again. OK. Let's talk about the ethnography, and then perhaps all these highfalutin things will start to make a little more sense. So the, the particular project that we've been engaged in um, has, is a study of deep space science, and in particular, a study um, that we've conducted for a couple of years of the Cassini project um, run out of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Now, one of the things that this sort of brings up, and those of you who are familiar with ethnographic work, right, you know that you know, it comes from an anthropological tradition, and it's basically characterized by going somewhere. And that place normally called the site, right? So one of the things that's sort of complicated for us in this project is, is even just to figure, figure out what the site is. In one aspect, the site is the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, of which this is an aerial photograph, um, a, a facility um, located next door to and co-run with Caltech, um, nestled in the foothills in Pasadena, the northern um, reaches of, of Los Angeles, um, a place that runs a lot of NASA um, uh, missions. It's not a research center like Ames is. It's an operations and engineering center. Um, and, and indeed, that is the place to which uh, you know, my student Marissa, doing her ethnographic work, would go on a regular daily basis. Now, Cassini happens in many places. The Cassini project has run from here. This is where the operations people are. This is where the, a lot of the science work happens too. But Cassini is actually a project that involves many research groups distributed all over the, all over the US and indeed all over the world. Um, many so different scientific teams with um, responsibility for different to the scientific instruments, um, uh, all sort of controlling this, space, this spacecraft. Oh yeah, the spacecraft. The spacecraft is at another site. The spacecraft is um, tumbling around in space, uh, um, and in particular has, since 2004, been exploring the Saturn system. Saturn, its, its rings, and some of its moons. So um, it's been there, as I say, since, 2000, since 2004. The, space, the whole project, in fact, was um, initiated in the early 1980s um, uh, and then designed during the 1980s based on often actually technology that had been developed in the 1970s used in previous NASA projects or platforms that had been used in previous NASA projects, um, built in the 1990s launched in 97, and then it got to Saturn 
in 2004. And at that point, it's what they call its prime mission began, which was um, actually due um, only to uh, uh, the prime mission was, was, was between 2004 and 2007. And that was the sort of first round of exploration. Then they went into what they call XM, the extended mission. Um, which took us up to uh, around about two, around about 2010, maybe 2011. Um, which since which point they have been in XXM, the extended extended mission. You can begin to see it's like there is something that comes after us. Just like yeah, um, there are, the plan is finally that the spacecraft will that the whole mission will come to an end in 2017 when they enter the death spiral, as they call it, and that um, spacecraft will. Um, or spiral into Saturn itself, gathering as much data as it does before it dies. Um, so, you know, in one way, our site is, uh, is, is in Pasadena, in the northern reaches of Los Angeles. In some ways, our site is somewhere between a half a billion and a billion kilometers away, depending on the particular astronomical configuration at any moment, um, with a spacecraft that is flying a very complicated um, path around um, Saturn and, and, and the Saturn system itself. Um, you know, and in some ways, the site is actually the robot, the spacecraft, an object about the size of a sort of medium-sized school bus, um, um, to which a whole variety of um, instruments have been have been bolted. The bolting of instruments to this spacecraft is actually a really important part of this story, as it turns out. So the original design for Cassini was that it would have all these different kind of scientific instruments mounted on a thing that looks basically like a lazy Susan, which they called a scan platform that would be out on an arm. So there'd be a gimbal at the end, and they'd be able to like point different instruments at different kinds of things. That was, in the delightful organizational jargon that goes along with these things, value engineered out of the design. That is, they ran out of money. And, um, and so instead, they bolted all the instruments directly to the body of the spacecraft. Um, that saves money, but creates a number of confusions and problems for the organization. One is that it means that uh, even more uh, critically than when they were on the scan platform, when one instrument is pointed at the planet, say, or whatever the object of astronomical um, scientific attention is just now, none of the other instruments can be because the craft has to be pointed like this and then it points like that, right? And they, they, all the objects, all the, um, all the uh, instruments point in different kinds of directions. That means that to rotate the spacecraft and point it in a new direction, you know, to, to make a different observation involves rotating this whole spacecraft. Um, and that costs fuel and energy. These are very, very precious commodities. Um, and so there's a lot of debate has to happen um, about what, uh, what the benefit is of pointing your instrument rather than my instrument at this particular ring at this particular moment when balanced against the, uh, the, pro the problems of, of spending fuel and the rest of it. Then there's all sorts of other weirdnesses, right? So, you know, if this instrument is pointed at the, at the, at the um, at the planet and the sun's behind me, then I have to be careful because now the sun might have to heat, might heat up that part of the spacecraft too much, and so I can't point this thing at the planet for too for too often. So people don't want their instrument on the side of the spacecraft that's opposite the radiation grills and things. All sorts of kind of nightmarish stuff like this. But this basically, this is the spacecraft is arguably um, arguably also our site. Certainly, the site of everybody of everybody's attention. Now, the other thing that's really important to say about the spacecraft is that nobody has seen it since 1997. Right? That's the last time it was like locked up, in, you know, locked up in a in in a, in a rocket and bla and blasted off. Um, so it's kind of an interesting thing here, but we have this object of everybody's attention that nobody has seen. <coughs> for over a decade that we can't touch, that we can't see, we can't see it through, through telescopes. Um, nothing will resolve that way. Um, there's a question of, um, of how it is we have any kind of access to this craft. Never, not us ethnographically, but the space scientists themselves. And we're going to sort of get into that. So automatically, and you can hear some of the things I've been saying, automatically in this project, we have a bunch of complicated tensions and relationships that need to be unpacked. 
The first one is the relationship between science practice and engineering. There are scientists who, after all, are, do who are doing the scientific work for which the spacecraft was launched, which you would argue is the point of the mission. And then there are a separate set of people for much of our ethnographic work on a different floor in the building um, doing the engineering work of keeping the spacecraft alive, making the whole thing work, getting it from point A to point B. Engineering supports science, but engineering is often in conflict with science. Sometimes doing the science you want to do endangers the spacecraft. Um, for instance, pointing an instrument in a way that might cause another part of the spacecraft to heat up, um, making quick turns, the sort of thing that, um, that, that, that might uh, endanger the spacecraft, or in something that might endanger the life of the spacecraft. That is, to run out of fuel now would be bad, and so we need to make the fuel last, and so you get automatically this kind of like tension between, on the one hand, the engineering aspect of keeping the thing going and making sure it's still there tomorrow, and the scientific problem of um, getting the data that you need, getting the observations you need, doing the science that you need. Um, you, there's also, of course, a sort of tension or an important relationship, especially when we take a socio-material perspective, between the things that are happening on the ground and the things that are happening in space, right? There's a spacecraft over there, there's ground systems over here, here are two pieces of technology that have to be kept in some kind of, a, in some kind of alignment. There's people down here and there's no people up there, at least as far as we know. Um, so, so, you know, you might imagine that any kind of like socio-material breakdown says the material is off in space and the social stuff is down here. Uh, so what I'm, I'm actually going to argue against that as we get to the end. There's another important tension that um, I'm not going to talk about so much, but it's so fascinating that I want to mention it here, and it will come up a little bit. The people, uh, for, so in some, <laughs> Cassini is a complicated project. There are many ways in which Cassini is doing some of the most advanced spacecraft science that NASA, and therefore humanity, has ever done. Nobody has ever flown a spacecraft that far away this long before. We've sent spacecraft further away, and there's been missions that lasted longer, but we didn't fly them. Those were ballistic orbits, like Voyager. You know, it's like you put it on a catapult and shoot it off into space. We don't, like, move it around. Cassini moves around, right? We fly it. We turn it. We, put, we, we change our minds about where it's going, and it needs to send it, send it off in another direction. The space navigation that's happening in Cassini is by far the most advanced, complicated, extended, and extensive navigation that anybody's ever done. But at the same, so it's, it's cutting edge in that sense. At the same time, it's a dinosaur. Nobody at NASA would ever run a project this way. Again, remember what I said, initiated in 1982, built in the eight, or designed in the 80s, built in the 90s, launched in 97. Um, a lot of things have happened at NASA and to NASA since 1982. Um, we plan missions differently now. We do missions differently now. Um, faster, better, cheaper, all these things um, change the kind of dynamic of organizational work at NASA. We don't do that. They don't do projects the way that Cassini is done. Similarly, as I said, we built, or Cassini was built um, using uh, platforms like, you know, arch hardware architectures that had been developed on previous missions, you know, like in the 70s and in the 60s, right? All their software is written in Fortran um, because that's what there was then. And so it looks... Um, so every, even at the same time as it's this cutting edge project, it's this jewel in the crown, it's this amazing thing where people, space navigators, are desperate to get onto this project because you can do things you couldn't do anywhere else. At the same time, it's also this dinosaur. And that tension is actually really sort of Im really important to the ethnographic work as well. Okay, so what I'm going to do is talk through, um, preferably without blinding myself by staring at the projector, I want to talk through three cases, three examples, three moments um, that come from our ethnographic work that will provide us with some perspective for coming back to this question of sociomateriality and, and asking again, what might it, how should we be understanding this relationship between the material obdurate stuff out of which we build systems and the social world that lives around them? And the first one actually, 
ref um, connects to this problem, this thing about navigation, the cutting edge and amazing navigation that, that, um, that they're doing, and at the same time, the, the ancient dinosaur nature of it. Um, so as I say, the software that Cassini uses was all built in its, its Fortran held together with Perl scripts. Um, every computer science in the, scientist in the room is like, Ugh. Um, <laughs> and uh, and the, the Fortran code is all pretty old. Uh, these are well worked out, well tested systems that we've used for previous um, for previous space missions, previous that is to 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 Cassini. So going back pretty far, in th they've developed it a lot. They've tweaked it. They've done all sorts of things to it to suit their own particular their their own particular needs. But it's an old kind of crufty system. Now. In, the, in a new sort of more efficient world, um, NASA certainly doesn't want to be, well, A, doesn't want to be running this old Fortran code for every new mission we run. You know, that seems like a bad idea. And cu having custom software, not custom navigation software for each mission also seems like a bad idea. So an organizational mandate came out to develop um, cross-mission uh, navigational software. A system that, you know, the system was built ended up being called, called Monty. Um, and I ought to be able to remember what it stands for, but I can't. It's in my paper. Um, and so Monty is a new C++ and Python based uh, uh, navigational system that's intended to be the uniform platform for all navigational systems at all navigation, all missions at, at Cassini that involve navigation. And so Cassini, the Cassini, or all missions at NASA that involve navigation. So the Cassini people naturally are included in this charge. So the, NASA, the Cassini people were told, we would like you to start running Monty as your navigational, piece of navigational software. So they started exploring this, this possibility. And they quickly ran into um, a series of problems uh, that basically you know, stem from the fact that Monty would give different directions to the spacecraft than their legacy software did. Monty had a different way of doing the math. Monty was using different floating point algorithms. And Monty was using different assumptions. And the whole result was that it was inconsistent with the navigational software that was already working. Um, the the nav navigators tell us they're actually both correct. But they're sort of correct in their own universe of assumptions. And it's pretty difficult to make the shift from a piece of software that has successfully, as far as we can tell, gotten you to Saturn and flown you around. Um, um, and you know, just because the other one is, is, is written in C++, despite any of these organizational mandates. The inverse problem with this, the navigational software isn't just telling the spacecraft where to go. It's the only thing that tells us where it is. It's sort of like you know, dead reckoning on steroids here, right? The spacecraft, we can't see the spacecraft. The only thing we know is we've told it to go places, and it seems to have gotten those places from the telemetry it sends back to us. Um, but all the telemetry is always you know, at, le at least 90 minutes old. So it's like all you ever know about where the spacecraft is is where the software says it is. It's the only kind of object that you have to point at. The spacecraft, for, many, for, for navigational purposes, for operational purposes, is a software-produced object. If you want to know where the spacecraft is, it's only the software that can tell you. You don't actually have any direct contact with the, with the it's not direct contact with the craft that tells you where it is. So the idea of making the switch becomes even more problematic. It's not just here's a new way of telling the spacecraft where to go and a new different set of calculations about where the spacecraft might go, but it's even a change in a notion of where the spacecraft is. So these were kind of complicated problems to um, to resolve, and the, the 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 resolution actually at first was we'll run both systems in parallel for two months and then we'll switch over. Well, it's been years at this point, and nobody's switched over, and whether they actually switch over is you know is 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 un is uncertain. But. Um, yeah, they actually called it going the full Monty. That's not my pun. Um, the, but, the, uh, but it does, this, this sort of produces, this, this moment of anxiety around, around the navigational software and the idea of the uncertainty of knowing where the object is or even of knowing how it is that one might know where the object is is a really interesting one, right? Because that's the anxiety that's provoked. 
It's like, if this software is correct and is telling us something new, then what does that mean about what we knew before? But we knew that what we knew before was OK because we hadn't crashed it into anything yet. So, so we must be at least approximately correct. So it's like it produces this anxiety about how the organization might even ever know what's going on. And the attempts they made to reconcile the two were confounded by the fact that the software carries all these levels of accretions and complications with it. It becomes, once the software you know, has lived for as long as this software has lived, difficult if not impossible to read the algorithm back off the software. We were talking about algorithms earlier, earlier at lunch and, and the kinds of um, the ways that algorithms obfuscate every bit as much as they elucidate, right? You know, um, it can be difficult actually to extract what the algorithm is in here that's giving it different kind of answers, especially where it's dependent upon different kinds of, for instance, double precision floating point routines, different algorithms, different numerical algorithms that the libraries will depend on. The fact that the old software even runs on different kinds of computers than the new software does. So it's like, and on, never mind on different versions of the operating systems, these guys are continually in the business of keeping old operating systems and old computers that you've all ignored and I've all ignored for years going because that's where the stuff actually runs. Um, you can't take the slice, the core sample through all those different kind of layers and pull it out and say, that's the algorithm and oh look, it's incompatible here with what that, co what that piece of code is doing. Um, so the material configurations of, uh, of, of software objects and hardware objects and their sort of their complicated sort of entanglements um, become, uh, uh, you know, begin to obscure what it is the organization even knows about how to navigate spacecraft and where a, space, where a spacecraft is. Um, it obscures the sort of the, uh, the, the um, the expertise that the organization has, despite the fact that there could be no more expertise about space navigation than there is than there is at NASA, right? These guys are clearly expert, but the ways in which they're expert are not even necessarily available to them because of the ways they're entwined with the software systems. The other thing that makes this matter is, a, is another important material consideration, which is the, temp, the which are the temporalities of of this stuff. One of the things, one of the problems, for what, one of the aspects of the Cassini project that manifests itself in this stuff is that you can't stop. Um, so you know, in the in the organizational shifts that have happened at NASA and the move from like large projects to small projects, the Mars rovers are often held up as sort of the golden child of the new NASA, right? That's you know we should know, everything should be like the Mars rovers, and indeed that there's much to learn from the Mars rovers. And we study uh, Janet's done a lot of work studying the Mars rover stuff, and and um, and the the Cassini people certainly you know admire the Mars rover project, but they also point out that for the navigational problems for the Mars rover people are a lot small, small um, um, a lot. Smaller, because if the Mars rover doesn't know where it is, it can stop until it figures it out. And if the people, if the, if the scientists don't know where to send it, they can stop and make a decision. You know, the space, the Mars rover won't go anywhere until you tell it to go, and in the meantime, it'll just sit there. Um, you don't get to do that with Cassini. There is no like putting on the brakes and stopping and just parking in space until you figure this stuff out. Um, it's continually moving. Um, it must continually move. And so the idea of any kind of like flag day for switching over, it's like, okay, everyone stop now, um, just doesn't happen, right? Everyone, people can stop, the spacecraft ain't gonna stop. Um, and in fact, the temporality here is not a punctuated temporality as it is for various other kinds of things. It's a continual ongoing thing. And the ongoingness of it, the never endingness of it, the never stopping of it, is actually a really important kind of consideration. This doesn't just happen with spacecraft, though. Many, say, modern websites will have continually running different possible futures. Bridging them at different points, it's hard to Absolutely, ask. absolutely. That um, um, I, and, and I would say there's two things. Um, one is we only have one spacecraft. Um, actually, we have two, because but, but the, the other one's still here. Uh, um, uh, and, and, and the other is um, 
it took us a long time to learn how to do that, and we have to build our systems for that. And it's not clear to me that actually the kind of technological platforms they have on there allow for allow for this. But yeah, I mean, you can see, and they clearly have. Like I say, they're running the navigational systems in par in, in parallel. It's just the switch over that's the complicate that's the complicated part here. Um, but they're but they're certainly um, they have a continual sense. I'm not talking actually so much in today's talk about the temporalities of this project, but they're well actually somebody asked me about the temporality of or the project at the end because it's really interesting. We'll talk about it there. But there's this sense continually of its ongoing, right? It's like it's always, you're always like, you know, in the middle of things. Um, okay. So that was number one, that uh, going the full Monty. The second of the sort of three things I want to talk about um, that sort of give us some kind of perspective on these questions of sociomateriality um, arises around a ways of accounting for technological de degradation. So spacecraft has to tumble in space and move around to point its different kinds of instruments at, the, at the, whatever the object of astronomical and scientific attention is at any given moment. It has two ways of doing that. You can fire, like you know, rockets, and like you know, move that way. Um, but the spacecraft all, can also sort of rotate on its own axis, and it does this by having a set of what they call reaction wheels, which are wheels you can sort of spin up, and you know, by the conservation of angular momentum, you can, you know, the spacecraft will will rotate um, in the in the in the opposite direction. And so, if you have a series of wheels mounted on different axes, you can sort of rotate the spacecraft without using up quite so much of the fuel as you would if you were if you were using the, using the engines. So that's how the spacecraft was launched, with a series of wheels all working just fine. Um, and af but after a while, they began to notice that the wheels weren't behaving exactly to spec. One of the wheels was breaking down. Um, now, the actual process of interpreting what the wheels do is really complicated because you also actually used, it, it was dragging, but drag is actually one of the ways that they do gravitational measurements as they get close to things. And actually, at some points, you deliberately fly the spacecraft through the outer atmosphere of some, uh, of some bodies in order to in or, and use the drag to assess what the, um, the density of that atmosphere is and so forth. But nonetheless, they were, begin they were beginning to recognize that they weren't getting the performance that they expected and that the wheels were degrading. And eventually, actually, one of the wheels Got, got turned off and they sort of put in a, put in a backup. But it created this um, tension within the project where now we, they sort of went, oh, we need to be paying attention to the, to, the, to the performance of the reaction wheels as a way of understanding what the spacecraft's doing and what things are doable, what things we can actually support. So they built a piece of software called Arbot, the reaction wheel bias optimization tool. That one I remember. Um, and Arbot is a mathematical model of the behavior of the wheels that allows them to um, evaluate potential movements of the spacecraft, pointing arrangements of the spacecraft, observations the spacecraft's going to make, in terms of the reaction, the impact upon the reaction wheels, whether it's going to take the reaction wheels into dangerous frequency bands that are sort of problematic and cause the reaction wheels to degrade faster, or whether this is um, a, a safe maneuver, what they often call Arbot friendly, a design that's going to like work with the work with the with the reaction wheels. But there's a couple of problems. So the first is. Our bot is kind of a slow piece of software. It just, I mean, there's a lot to figure out here, and it takes a long time. It takes a kind of, more, more than it takes a long time, it takes an unpredictable amount of time. I can tell you, um, as somebody who lives in Los Angeles, any studies that are ever done of like traffic and the things that cause stress on your commute are not about how long your commute is, it's about how predictable your commute is. The problem with our bot and the thing that causes organizational stress is not that it takes a long time to run, but that nobody quite knows how long it's going to take to run. And nobody quite knows what it is that it's going to say. We know the algorithm, we know the math, but we don't know it. Nobody's got a sort of intuitive understanding of it, at least not on the science side. The engineers have a better understanding of it. But, but from the science side, all they know is that once upon a time they could say, this is the instrument pointing that I need to do, and go do it, and the engineers would say, okay, here's your data. And now they say, here's the instrument pointing that I need to do, and the engineers say, no, we're not going to do that. That's not friendly to the wheels. But that they might say that at an unpredictable moment. Um, so the um, inscrutability 
of our bot at the same time as it's the absoluteness of its decisions or its statements is sort of a problem. Um, and so the organization had to sort of switch things around in order to try to get to a point where they could do science in a way that would not bring it into conflict with, 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 with engineering. The scientists wanted a set of guidelines saying what kinds of things are Arbot friendly and what kinds of things are not. But they, Arbot doesn't work that way. You can't say you can point it this way and you can point it that way and it's going to be OK, because it's all about how you get from over here to over there. And it depends on where the spacecraft is. And again, the gravitational forces that impinge upon it at different, at different kind of moments. Um, and so nobody can quite get to what the, um, what's Arbot friendly is. The software, the algorithm, has inserted itself into the organizational planning process. And in fact, the organization had to completely change its scientific planning process to place Arbot assessment early on. Because now, uh, there, was a, there was a moment of bizarre breakdown where the engineers said to the scientists, well, you need to, so that we can figure out which of these things we're going to be able to do, you need to give us the science observations in you know, on some kind of priority order. And the scientists are like, are you guys kidding? Everything on here is a priority. That's why it's on the list. We spent six months fighting with each other, figuring out what things we were going to put on the list. The result of that is, is like, it's just everything's a high priority. Um, so so the, 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 the organization actually had to respond by also making all sorts of changes in order to incorporate Arbot into what they're doing. Now, this is an interesting thing. They're not really, in some ways, incorporating the reaction wheels into what they're doing. They're incorporating Arbot into what they're doing. Arbot is a piece of software that was, after all, built without, if after the wheels that it talks about were already millions of miles away, right? You know, nobody's seen the wheel since we built Arbot. We actually only have a, you know, an in principle understanding that what Arbot says is actually what's going on with the wheels because we built the software afterwards. Um, so it's kind of complicated how we incorporate this thing. So that then takes me to the second point, which is this one about sort of where's the material here? If we talk about social material, we say the social organization has responded in some ways. It's responded to material constraints. But you could argue that the material constraints to which it's responding are not the degradation of the wheels, but rather the operation of a piece of software on a particular computer. Yeah? That is, if this is something that actually the organization could respond to differently because I can put more memory into my computer and have it you know, come up with an answer faster, that's a kind of interestingly alternative material constraint here. The materiality that's grounding their practice is not simply the materiality of a school bus sized object tumbling around in space. It's the materiality of the ground systems, the materiality of the computers, the fact that, that software takes a while to run and that we don't necessarily know how long that takes. Okay, skip on to the third. Um, five past two, is that what you said? That's what we've got to? Okay, good. Um, the third example is, um, is grounded in a piece of software called the Tour Atlas. Um, there is, it will be no surprise to you, a lot, a lot of software going on in this system. And some software is absolutely mission critical. You know, the kind of software which, you know, if this software was to go wrong, a spacecraft filled with radioactive fuel would explode in orbit and rain the fuel down on the voters of some particular congressional district. So we can't have that happen, obviously. Um, and you know, so uh, uh, some software is like, important but less critical and so forth. So nat and actually NASA has all this, this whole set of categories, category A, category B, category C, depending on the, the criticality of the software and the process by which it will be developed, modified, and changed. There is also a term people use, category D, which refers to uncategorized software, right? this residual category, all the other stuff. The category D software is like the kind of little things that you build for yourselves. Your, your Python programs and your Perl scripts and your random little bits of wizardry that hack together the different pieces of your life and make it possible for you to actually get anything done. Um, the Tour Atlas is, is a piece of category D software. So the Tour Atlas is, is this, is, is this um, set of scripts that generates HTML pages that describe things about how, um, where the spacecraft has been in the past and how certain kinds of um, arrangements, navigational and pointing arrangements were achieved. 
it takes a slice through lots of databases um, and pulling information from all sorts of different kinds of places in order to just help people to, uh, to um, get their work done more easily by reusing knowledge from the history of the, from the, history of the mission. Um, the Tour Atlas was a set of scripts put together by a guy. We'll call him Jim. Uh, and, Jim the, and the thing is that Jim was building these software pretty much for his own benefit. But pretty soon, everybody got the idea that it was there. People would go, you know, you would know that if you could save yourself some time by going and getting work, sitting down at Jim's desk with Jim and having Jim take you through whether the particular kind of thing you've done, you're wanting to do is something we've ever done before. Or how is the organization able to do this? Well, here's, here's, it, here's, its, here's its history. Um, it's just, you know, and this, this is partly because the planning process for these things is so long. So as I told you, all the different, all the different scientists have to like hash out from amongst themselves how it is they're going to get their instruments to point it in the places, they, the ways they want, and, and make, get their observations to get their science. And there's all sorts of competition between different scientists about, you know, to do this. And so there's a, you know, that's one complicated process of like, you know, I need this, you know, a bunch of planets time on this next pass. No, no, you haven't published enough journal papers lately. So clearly your stuff isn't generating enough science. Um, so, you know, and, and you don't want to go through all that process and then get to the end and discover you can't do it, right? You, the spacecraft can't be pointed in that direction. So this is a way to have a sort of responsive tool that you can be using early in the planning process to figure out, well, we know this works because we know we did it before and this gave me, you know, a scan pattern that works for the ultraviolet spectrometer, whatever it is. Um, but then Jim left. Um, because NASA has a matrix model, matrix organization, and, um, and, and, uh, and so people often move around inside the organization, different sort of different missions, um, and, and the tour atlas sort of fell apart. And so then some people were put on the job, the rather unusual job of like, of, of maintaining category D software, right, which is meant to be inherently unmaintained. Um, in order to sort of make things work. And they managed to put it back together again in some ways, uh, but, but you know, then it never sort of operated quite the way that it ever did before. Because Jim wasn't just the programmer after all, he was the person. He was the guy who knew how to make this work. And this wasn't actually about um, using Jim's software. This was about working with Jim. It was always about working with Jim. It was Jim who could um, could steer you through the archive. He knew how to navigate the archive in terms that the Tour Atlas provided. Um, and the organization, I mean, it hasn't lost knowledge in the sense that all the databases that say where they've been and how they got there and what they did when they got there are still there. Um, and our bot still, or I'm sorry, the Tour Atlas still works as a way to extract, now, as a way to extract stuff. And yet, the way in which it's going to be entwined into a sort of informal planning process has sort of broken down because it ended up sort of um, relying so much on, on, on Jim. Um, so the software evolves, it is after all, and, and it evolves as a mode of figuring, right, as a mode of figuration. The software now gives, because the Cassini team members, a new way to represent C, to figure um, the, the, the spacecraft's own movements, its history of movements, its potential movements, its past, its potential futures. Um, uh, the software evolves, the organization evolves, but they don't necessarily evolve together and in lockstep. And the, 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 the issue in particular here is that um, we can maintain the software, we can maintain the code, but what they actually find more problematic is maintaining the set of relations around the code that actually make it work. As I say, the issue with making the Tour Atlas work is not making the code work. Using the Tour Atlas was not running a piece of software. Using the Tour Atlas is sitting with Jim. Um, and, and so the Tour Atlas was always and only an adjunct to a series of things that Jim was doing, even as it was a sort of database browser, right? So your database browser only works if you know how to, how to look through it. So, so three cases, uh, Monty, Arbot, and the Tour Atlas. Three pieces of software, 
um, that are deeply entwined into sort of organizational life and scientific practice. Three modes of figuring, um, three ways of seeing the spacecraft, seeing the mission, producing a representation of it. In the case of Monty, really, like literally in figures, numbers, digits. Um, in the case of Arbot, in terms of like its yes or no answers about the danger to the spacecraft and the terms of, and for, for the tour atlas, ways of figuring particular moments of history and, poten and potential, potential futures. Um, each of which speak to questions of socio-materiality by giving us points of purchase on the relationship between social forms and material forms. Um, so, so what would this tell us about the ways that people have tried to analyze socio-materiality as, or employ socio-materiality as, um, as a way of analyzing organizational needs and the relationship to, of societies, to, to, of, of social structures to, to technology? Well, well, the first one is, is sort of, you know, the first kind of socio-material uh, 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 conception is one of like the social and the material as separate, yeah? And then that the analysis that we want to understand is one that speaks to the relationality between them, right? Speaks to how this, these two go together. There's the social world. There's the material world, and socio-materiality is about how do we, how do we stitch, these, stitch these together. You would think that a separation kind of approach to socio-materiality would work really well here. After all, we have a project which has arguably two sites, which are approximately a billion kilometers apart. Pretty separate. So a separation argument kind of ought to be useful here, but we just don't, you know, we don't find that separation working. After all, arguably what people interact with is not the spacecraft. What they interact with is all sorts of stuff in the ground systems, which are apparently telling a story about where a spacecraft might be, but you know, it might have been captured by the Martians and they could be beaming us all, all back, all sorts of weird telemetry, right? Um, they, uh, the, 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 the notion of looking for points of separation as a way of understanding the relationship between a world that is purely social here and a world that is purely material there that somehow have some kind of um, um, link, that just, that, that just doesn't seem to work very well in this case. Even in fact, if we don't draw the dividing line at the outer planets. Um, um, even if we even if we look for other other kinds of separations, um, there's a there's a much more complicated tangle um, tangle at work here. The second kind of approach that a lot of people have taken in the in the socio materiality literature is a sort of um, a, a sort of symmetry approach, which says. Social and material are two aspects of the kind of sort of like contemporary organizational systems, contemporary social systems that sort of mirror each other in the ways in which they push on um, the push on the world. Uh, they sort of constitute. They both constitute the world. Um, they both bring the world into particular kinds of arrangements, um, and they do so in sort of roughly equal symmetric you know, ways. They do so in lockstep. The social and the material are both continually making things that making things um, uh, the way they are. Um, that's a, you know, that's a, I like that a little better than the separation argument, um, but we don't find that working terribly well analytically for us in this data either. Because in fact, in our situation, what we seem to have, I mean, the symmetry argument again, I remember right at the beginning I was saying these things all sort of refigure around where do you locate the agency. And the symmetry argument says you locate it um, equally continually in both, of the, in both of these domains. But we sort of find that kind of rocking back and forth here. Sometimes 
the stuff that's going on on the ground is what matters the most. Sometimes it's stuff that's going on in the organization. Sometimes it's the stuff that, that, the, that the, uh, the materiality of the computer systems. Sometimes there are these interventions from the Saturn system where broken down or degrading um, wheels or bad telemetry suddenly forces a reorganization of both technical and social um, material practice on the practice on the ground and so forth. So, so a symmetry argument doesn't seem to work because it's more of a sort of tacking back and forth that we're finding that we're finding at work. And then finally, um, the the you know this this sort of shaping argument is sort of the third of the, the ways in which, again, many people have tackled the social material, which is primarily that sort of, you know, it's still hearkening back to the social constructionist, the idea that places us, humans, social systems, as the primary force in shaping material realities. We shape material realities, and then and we use them as tools to, to create particular kinds of arrangements, tools to create particular kinds of um, 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 outcomes that still sort of places us at the center. Um, that one just to sort of, you know, is we don't see this kind of unidirectionality. As I said, we've got this sort of tacking, tacking back and forth. So, by placing an emphasis, I sort of began with, and, and the, the paper on which this talk is based sort of really sort of argues instead for a kind of understanding this in terms of reconfiguration, right? Figuring the figural practices by which particular kinds of models of reality are produced. Doing so configuring, doing that figuring in a way that is deeply connected to what they describe, because you know, uh, uh, you know, you've got you can't be decoupled from that, um, and reconfiguring that is the idea that this has to be done again and again and again and again. That like the spacecraft tumbling through, ongoingly through space, you never stop. It's always partial. It's always it's always incomplete. And so we have this sort of asymmetric, dynamic, shifting set of relations between those things that we can think of as material, perhaps, and those things that we can think of as social, um, or, the, or the social aspects of the whole and the re relational aspects of the whole um, seen as sort of projections, rather than, um, uh, rather than a sort of um, this sort of simpler separation symmetry or, or, or shaping kind of analysis. The idea here is to pay attention to the representational practices that technologies provide us with, to think about the technologies that we're used to thinking about as things that do stuff through our control or whatever in the world, but thinking about them also as things that present the world to us, that craft a representation of it and give it to us in such a way that it makes certain kinds of opportunities for action manifest. Um, and thinking, I think about these kind of technologies in figural representational ways and understanding the material constraints upon those kinds of representations gives us a different route into thinking what, or about organizations and what they do here. Um, I am not going to talk, this is part of a larger project um, um, on the materialities of information and thinking about the material constraints around information itself, not information infrastructures and not just the fact that servers cost money and they have to sit in rooms and they use electricity and they move like hot air from one place to another and the rest of it, but thinking about how information itself has um, material properties, granularity, temporality, um, um, malleability, and, and so forth. That's a larger project um, that I would have talked about if I hadn't already talked for so long. So I will not talk more about that. Um, but um, oh, I don't know, maybe I'll come back and talk about it another time. All right. Um, I think we still have some time to take questions. Thank you, speaker. Paul, can you pull back out from, from the Mars work and from the Cassini project and articulate, for those of us who might be unfamiliar with the approach that you're using, um, the value of this work in other sociomaterial contexts. Why should someone who doesn't care about Cassini but does care about computation, information systems, communication processes writ large, care about how we, how, about reconfiguration in the manner that you've described it? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I mean, I think the first thing is just to try to uh, to focus on the figural in 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 most of this stuff, um, which I think often goes away. We think about you know we sort of 
we recognize that what we're using in most, in most digital systems are representations of some sort. And yet the ways that they get made effective often sort of, I think, then blinds us to their figural properties, um, especially over time. And so the other part is actually, I think, that um, the dynamics of this and the, temporal, and the temporal dynamics of it. So the fact that this is sort of always ongoing becomes really, uh, really important. Um, I was talking uh, to some of the guys here earlier today about some work I've been doing around sort of the materialities of, of, of databases. And one of the important things there is to sort of recognize the database as a historically maturing form in which if, you know, the kinds of things that databases did yesterday inform us about the kinds of things that databases might do tomorrow. And so that figural coupling to the world that is both sort of productive um, of particular kinds of experience as well as somehow you know um, speaking back to you about, about the world um, are really important. I think that changes the way that um, a lot of the a lot of the um, argumentation around socio materialities, particularly in organizational studies, um, happens. And I think it's um, much much broader than simply the simply the, the Cassini stuff. But because we do frequently have this um, this idea of uh, the, the, the running the idea of the sort of, for instance, a separation between um, it, between individually and separately constituted domains of a social and material that somehow you know oh yeah I have to build a, a conceptual bridge there but they, they that you know puts them together but keeps them apart at the same time is 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 I think what we're trying to what we're trying to do so Cassini turns out to be a useful place to do that because of some of the um, separations that it has uh, but I think that I think the points speak much more broadly to the way that that the notion of sort of the social the material are invoked as that sort of analytic frame. Michael. So as perhaps another connection here, you're sort of making a Plato's cave argument where you know we can't actually see the spacecraft, but we can sort of see some, some shadows of it. And yeah, I, I made a, a connection earlier to sort of the web. And imagine now you're Facebook. You can move all of these, these code wheels, and all you see are data later about people clicked this many more things, they liked this many more things, they, they were doing this, they were friending people, and you have this sort of indirection. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening is that you know, the, the socio, like the organization is still trying to manage this, this indirect data about how people are acting. And I wonder if you think that's actually a similar kind of uh, set of uh, entanglements that's going on, mm -hmm. or is it different? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, certainly you see, and we see in many of the cases of the database, um, and 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 working working with digital traces, um, this question of am I working with the data or am I working with what it is that data represents? Right? Am I reaching through the data or is the data is the is the data my 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 object? Um, and I do think, again, sort of going to, to what I was saying to Fred as well, that the it's it's actually often the temporal dynamics that pull this stuff back together because because you know what makes the data an effective proxy for certain kinds of activity is the fact that it's responsive in the right ways, right? That it that it maintains its identity over uh, uh, maintains its identity over over time. Um, I what I want to keep. Um, a focus of attention on, and this absolutely goes to like all the sort of big data arguments as well. The rest of it is that sort of mediating role of algorithms as sort of active objects that you know are producing certain kinds of uh, certain kinds of data for the for the you know for particular purposes, um, and and that we often I think forget about that sort of active role. I mean, this goes again to the things we were talking, chatting about earlier. It's like this this relationship between algorithms and data has in many ways become um, really quite problematic and you know lately as the as the data streams become them almost like themselves sort of live objects that um, that confound our ability to understand what the algorithms even even do right so you get to that sort of thing like these guys had with their with their navigational software where you can't you can't read the algorithm back off and even if you could it wouldn't really tell you very much right? which is that the complicated thing so I think trying to find what the right sort of figure ground shift is that allows us to keep both of those in view at the same time um, is, is really important. And I think that is something that would tie most of those sort of data practices to the kinds of things that these guys are doing too. Um, so anything that kind of you think about promoting something and then 15 years down the road, you, yeah, was, is there turnover? Are there people that oh, leave? Yeah. Like, and, how, and do the new people understand what the older people did? How do you pass that wisdom along? That's a so that's a a, a great question. 
Um, there is lots of turnover and lots of churn. And the kind of turnover and the kind of churn there is turns out to be fascinating. So, this, so, so they happen differently on the science, science side and the, um, and the engineering side. In this particular part of the project that I've been talking about today, we were mainly studying the engineering side. On the science side, you know, PIs die and they get replaced by their own graduate students and things like that. You know, there's a, there's a certain kind of like academic churn on that side. I'm not going to think too much about that. Um, on the engineering side, people certainly move around. The matrix organization kind of like forces that. People move into this project. Navigators, for instance, move into this project because they want to do the kind of like cool navigation stuff. Um, people sort of, people certainly cycle around a good deal. Um, the one of the things that is really fascinating, and actually Marissa is trying to write about this just now, on the engineering side, this project has become the province of a number of very senior, um, uh, older women. The men all moved on to hipper, cooler, more powerful projects. And many of the senior engineering women speak about this as um, a long-term investment, a duty of care they owe to the spacecraft and often the last mission they're going to do. So the woman who runs the engineering side now is actually the only person in the whole project who's ever touched the spacecraft because she was part of um, ALTO assembly something and testing, right? The, the sort of assembly launch and testing operations, the part where we put the spacecraft together. And she actually frequently draws on that knowledge. Like, no, no, that's not where that wire runs. That wire actually goes over here because I remember. And all those kinds of things. Um, but actually the gender issues associated with how people have moved into and out of this project is a fascinating thing all to itself that's a different, I mean, Marissa could get a second PhD, second PhD out of that. Um, but yeah, there's a real question about what it means to, for instance, move into a project that you know, primarily written in Fortran. How many people here, you know, how, how are your Fortran skills? Like, you know, up on that. Um, um, you know, are there, yeah, yes. <laughs> um, so, I remember talking to people at Cambridge University whose intro classes at that time were basic standard ML and COBOL. I'm like, what are you trying to do to these people? It's like, horrible. So, um, so it's, you know, it's really kind of intriguing to sort of think about what, how people do sort of like, you know, manage that, manage those, those skill sets, especially, and they have to work in a market kind of model where they're shopping their, you know, the way to make progress in the organization is not to stay with Cassini until the death spiral. The way to make progress in the organization is to pick up some skills here and then move somewhere else. So the organization kind of forces them into that sort of churn mode, but it has played out differently in science and engineering, and it's played out differently for people at different levels of seniority, and it's played out really differently across the sort of gender divides in ways that I find, I find fascinating. for in this talk is an approach that tries to say, well, you know, we don't want to think about them as, as parallel domains. We want to think about them as somehow always deeply entangled. That what we call the social or what we call the material are like selective projections out of this complicated tangled ball of stuff, social material stuff. And I want to think about um, how it is that they, they come together and that actually create the context for each other. That is, it's the social that creates the context for understanding what material materiality might even be and vice, ver and vice versa. This all sounds horribly abstract. It's going to get a little more ethnographic in a minute. Um, I'm trying to decide if I'm, I'll, I'll, the, 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 I was trying to decide if I was still going to use this slide. I'm just, like making things up on the fly. Um, uh, I'm going to come, yeah, so I'm going to say almost nothing about this, but the kind of lens we're trying to use and the, the, the launching off point for this is what we've been thinking about as, uh, as um, the word, around the word reconfiguring. So we talk very easily, perhaps even too easily, especially in technical circles, about reconfiguring things, about reconfiguring our technologies, about reconfiguring ourselves, about reconfiguring our organizations. Um, and certainly the people that we've been working with if ethnographically, who I'll tell you about in a second, um, use the word reconfiguring a great deal. But I want to stop and think about what might be implied by that word reconfiguring and start actually with the notion of figuring. So figuring is a notion that actually gets used a lot in feminist science studies and other kinds of, and, and, and similar sort of critical perspectives on, on science and technology. 
to refer to the process of producing represent or representing the world, figuring it and putting it in a figure, putting it in numbers, putting it in some kind of representational form, um, creating a representation that somehow abstracts from the world, but, but and, and in abstracting from the world makes sense of the world, but also produces the world that we experience because as we craft that figure, we also create a sort of le a perceptual lens for ourselves that begins to tell us about the world. So when I build a mathematical model of the world, that also then shapes how it is mean by socio, by socio material. Um, there has been in the organizational science literature over the last five, maybe ten years, an increasing interest in questions of socio-materiality. And if you like, we could see this as the latest in a sort of historical progression of ways of thinking about the relationship between technology and social practice, technology and social stuff, organizational life, and so forth. Um, if you look back at early work in understanding what happens around technology and what people do with it, that work is often characterized by a fairly sort of naive technological determinism, the idea that, you know, technology just happens and then we all adapt, right? You know, that, that, that bang, technology falls on us like a, like a meteor um, and, uh, and somehow, you know, there, there are ripple effects that, that, that change society. Um, the next sort of historical period of studies, particularly sort of organizational studies about technology and organizational life, focused on sort of what were there broadly what we might call social constructionists. So they say, actually, you know, technology doesn't just happen to society, we make technology, and it's society and social structures that provide us with an interpretive framework for understanding what a technology might be for us. Uh, it's not purely about its intrinsic properties, it's about how it gets used. And as we all go about organizational life, social life, cultural life, we are creating meaning for the, for, for the artifacts, the technologies, for the things that we do, the things that, things that are around us. So that seems like a, um, a slightly more satisfying position than the technological determinism. It, it gives us as human beings a little bit more of a role. Um, but in some ways, it's sort of a swing of the pendulum a little too far in the other direction, which somehow, or at least in its more, um, in, in some forms, seems to uh, evacuate the technology of any kind of intrinsic properties. We stop thinking about the constraints of the technology because it's somehow all socially constructed. So when people have, over the last couple of years, been arguing for a position on technological, uh, on social and cultural analysis of technology that takes, that, that's broadly called socio-material or socio-materiality, Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, it's really nice to be back at, at, at Stanford. Um, some of you will know I, I, I spent a very happy year here on sabbatical, um, um, I guess about seven years ago, because I think I'm due for another sabbatical. Uh, um, this, is, I think, is my, th my, my third uh, opportunity to talk in the, in the HCI seminar. I think there was 11 years between my first two and then seven between these, so I'm, 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 like, I'm speeding up. Um, so yeah, so this, this talk that I want to, um, the material I want to present today is based on a, a long-term study that we've been, that I've been doing along with some colleagues uh, of, of, it started off as a study of collaborative practice in deep space science and has evolved in a variety of, a variety of ways. When I first put a talk together around this work, I wasn't writing it as an HCI talk. Um, I'm going to try and present it a little more as an HCI talk today, or maybe perhaps an HRI talk. Right? I think what we are going to be talking about in here in a strange kind of way is, um, is human-robot interaction, um, where the robot happens to be a spacecraft around about a billion kilometers away. <laughs> 
So I want to start off, I should start off by, by acknowledging um, some of my collaborators who've been part of this project. Um, so Janet Vertezzi, who's a sociologist and uh, in the, on the faculty at Princeton, um, and an STS scholar who also spent some time with us at Irvine, um, has been uh, one of the, sort of has been working on aspects of this project with us uh, from, for, for many years now. Uh, Marissa Cohen, who was until recently my PhD student, is now my postdoc and will soon be um, an assistant professor at the IT University in Copenhagen. And Melissa Mismanian, who is um, one of my faculty colleagues at UC Irvine in the informatics department and is an organizational scholar. Um, uh, so so the, although I'm the only person here to present the talk, this is very much um, a collaborative, collaborative work. Okay, I better explain some of the stranger words in the title of my talk, and perhaps first and most importantly, try and think about what it is as I'm going to encounter that world, look at that world, think about that world, and so forth. So this notion of figuring has a bi-directionality to it, that I produce a figure, a graph, a graphic, a representation, an inscription, a, no a numerical model, or whatever it is. Um, and in doing it, I also kind of like begin to like line the world up in a particular kind of way. So I've got to be conscious of the bi-directional power of that figuring. By con when we turned figuring into configuring, this is con in the sense of sort of with, right? Figuring with. I never actually get to just figure things. I don't get to produce figures all on my own. The world has to cooperate. The world has to fit in with my figure. So this process of figuring that I do is actually one of engagement with the world. You've got to recognize the connection to the world that's implied by the production of the figure. And then by reconfiguring, we mean that you never get to do that just once, but it's an ongoing thing. I build a model of the world, and then I continually look at the world through that model, and I have to adjust the model, and I tweak it, and the world changes because of the model, and I have to do these things again. So it's never finished. Because a model is all, and a representation is always incomplete, there's always more work to be doing. So, when, so, so we found that we sort of, um, you'll see when I get to the end, when I like, talk, come back to this, but we actually, you know, when people would start to talk about reconfiguration, what we found really interesting sort of analytically in that are all three of these notions. That is, bringing the world into alignment with some kind of de depiction of it that we can have technological access to, doing that in a way that understands a connection between representational practice and the world, and doing it over and over and over and over again. Okay, let's talk about the ethnography and then perhaps all these highfalutin things will start to make a little more sense. So the, the particular project that we've been engaged in um, has, is a study of deep space science, and in particular, a study um, that we've conducted for a couple of years of the Cassini project um, run out of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Now, one of the things that this sort of brings up, and those of you who are familiar with ethnographic work, right, you know that you know, it comes from an anthropological tradition, and it's basically characterized by going somewhere. And that place normally called the site, right? So one of the things that's sort of complicated for us in this project is, is even just to figure out, figuring out what the site, is. what they want to point to is the idea that, um, that as things are social, they are also material. That as, um, uh, as social factors shape our experience, so too do the material, physical characteristics of technologies, spaces, places, um, um, the, things, the things that we use. And so we need, perhaps, a new kind of theoretical frame, a socio-material frame, that avoids the excesses of either technological determinism or pure social constructionism and steers a sort of middle path, right? So there's been a bunch of work of that sort emerging over the last, over the last several years. And that's sort of broadly where I'm going to be positioning, positioning this talk. However, as that sort of socio-material agenda has, been, has developed, it ha it, it, it's often been formulated in terms of a problem of identifying the locus of agency, that is, where things happen and who does stuff, right? How, that's like agency here for social analysis is like, you know, where is, the, where is the sort of social motive force, right? Who is an agent? Who gets to act? Where does acting happen? <laughs> 
right? And so, so you know, the, even the, the accounts of socio-materiality, which lie somehow halfway between a world in which technology is the thing that does things and the social world is the thing that does things. Um, even within this middle ground of socio-materiality, there's still this question of like, well, where, you know, the problem becomes, where do you locate the agency? Is it like, how do we find the balance point, an account that incorporates the social, incorporates the material, and somehow puts them, puts them together. And so lots of people, um, and I'll get more to this at the end, later in the talk where we sort of lift back up to the theory, um, lots of people have tried to sort of account for socio-materiality in terms of this thing about, well, we know that they're both important, but we need to find the balance point. We need to find where the problem is of agency. Is it more on the material side, and is it more, is it more on the social side? That's an approach to socio-materiality that somehow curiously at the same time as it tries to put the social and material together, also, I've got to argue, like holds them apart. It makes them parallel. It says they're both important, but somehow we've got to find the place where they touch, but they're somehow independent domains. And what we're going to try and argue